So what we have here then is my uh, HP Sweep Oscillator. It's an 8690B and uh, this really is an old piece of equipment. It's from 1966 so it's over 40 years old now and uh, I've had this for about four years. I have had some use out of it. Um, when I first got it it did make quite a bit of noise with the fan at the back and I actually uh, took the old DC fan out and uh, put a small switch mode power supply in there just to drive a 12 volt DC fan and uh, you know it is big and it's heavy and bulky you have to have it warmed up for at least half an hour before you actually start using it but I've since replaced this with uh, some more modern equipment and uh, just recently this unit actually failed so I'm not going to have an attempt to actually uh, fix this you know being 40 years old I think it, it is at the uh, end of its life now and it's also uh, got a lot of valve technology in there and I don't know a great deal about uh, valve technology. So what I thought I'd do then is just uh, take you around the unit, we'll have a look inside the unit itself, how the uh, mainframe is actually constructed and uh, then we'll have a closer look at the RF plug-in, I'll take that over to the bench and uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of parts on that RF plug-in that uh, I can actually salvage and use with the uh, test equipment that I've got here in the lab so a lot of useful parts in the RF section and uh, there may also be some useful parts in the mainframe itself but as I say it's uh, mostly valve technology. So if you take a look at the front then it's uh, a really really simple layout you don't have to spend a uh, lot of time studying the manual to uh, learn how to get this up and running you've got these big analog uh, pulley wheels here to actually select the start and the stop and you can also put markers along the way there and you've got these big latching uh, clunking switches here to uh, choose different uh, modes uh, along there with the frequency and uh, as I say it doesn't take a, a lot of uh, time to master how to use it it is really really simple to use and you can get different plugins for this. I've got the uh, 2 GHz to 4 GHz plugin, so uh, you could actually pull that out and put, say, a uh, 5 GHz to 8 GHz plugin in. And you can also pop uh, this scale out here and put the corresponding scale to the plugin that you've chosen. So it uh, really is a versatile unit, especially from 1966. But uh, as I say, it's just so old now, and with it not working, it's not actually worth fixing. So I picked this up off uh, eBay about four years ago and I think I paid £60 for this unit. I think the shipping was along the lines of £20 to uh, £25 because it is so heavy. And uh, that's not a calibration sticker on the front, it's actually a pat testing sticker. And it's got the next test for the pat testing here on the sticker and it's actually the 13th for the 10th 2010 so it was in service. Uh, until quite recently it was being used although um, I do know from actually working in schools and uh, other public buildings like that even if you're not using a piece of electrical equipment even if it's stored in your stock cupboard and it's uh, obsolete uh, most of these places like to get rid of this rather than having it laying around because even if it's lying around you uh, still have to have it pat tested here in the UK under the law so it was probably getting its uh, pat testing done but it could also easily have been uh, stored away in a uh, stock cupboard for the last 15 years. So here's a uh, quick look at the side then and all this section here is the uh, power supply section and we'll take a closer look at that in a moment but uh, you can see here the aluminium chassis itself is uh, extremely badly corroded so it's showing its age but uh, as I say it was working perfectly fine up until about six months ago. So here on the back then you've uh, not got a great deal at all you've got your uh, fuse in case it blows you've got a couple of BNC's and you've got some connections here for the pen lift so I'm presuming that uh, connects to some kind of plotter. And originally it belonged to the Admiralty in uh, Lincoln and the uh, duplexer department so it was probably uh, used for some kind of uh, radar testing or communications testing. And another thing although it's made by HP it's actually made in Great Britain. And this is a shot of the opposite side there's not a lot to see here that's the uh, RF plug in there and as I say we'll take a closer look at that later 
but there's also not as much corrosion here on the aluminium chassis so possibly that side was uh, closer to a window or somewhere where it uh, yeah, was a little bit damp at some time I don't know but uh, definitely not as much corrosion on this side so here we are looking down on the top of the uh, oscillator here and uh, this is the power supply section and uh, you've got a couple of big uh, tube valves there I'm not really sure what they do I'm uh, no expert on tubes whatsoever I've actually built nothing with uh, tubes in the past a uh, couple of big capacitors because as I understand it uh, tube technology takes a lot more volts and amps to actually operate than uh, solid state big uh, power transformer here and some more capacitors on uh, this side here so a lot of power going through the uh, power section here so this centre section of the oscillator then is the uh, main mainframe part of uh, this uh, unit it's what is actually connected to uh, all the controls on the front of the oscillator which uh, drive this uh, plug-in here you can have different plugins for this as I say and again um, lots of vintage uh, through-hole components here definitely worth saving and uh, again it's populated with lots of uh, different valves and this side is all the RF plug-in itself and as I say we'll take that out and have a uh, closer look at this on the bench so what I'm going to do turn it over and we'll see what's on the underside of this so here we are on the underside of the unit then again we've got some more PCBs here vintage through hole components and again lots of valves dotted around everywhere we can also see the uh, bottom of the big transformer here on this power side you can also see my uh, little hack here to put a uh, small power supply in there and I tied it directly to the 240 volt rail on the on off switch just to drive that uh, DC fan just to make it a lot quieter and that DC van fan actually uh, spends most of its energy cooling down those big two uh, valves that are on the uh, power supply itself and this unit would have cost a fortune back in uh, 1966 because all of this would have been constructed by hand all the wiring looms would have been made up by hand soldered on directly to the uh, distribution boards here so a lot of labour has uh, actually gone into just putting one of these together so the cost would have been astronomical I haven't looked it up to see how much they uh, would have cost but uh, trust me um, you know a uh, hobbyist would not have been able to afford to purchase this in 1966 and this is something that you do see a lot from around this time with uh, the HP stuff this is an expansion card so you can uh, put a test jig in here you can probably take these cards out stick this in to actually uh, expand it out and then plug your test equipment in so you can test for actually failure along all these wiring looms and components because trying to track a uh, fault down in these wires would have been a uh, major headache so these kind of expansion cards you do see these a lot in the uh, vintage uh, HP stuff from 1960, 1970, 1980 now as for the construction of this and the components used it's actually nothing like uh, what HP were actually producing as far as test equipment goes just 10 years later the uh, cards in here actually move around quite a bit There's, some of them are quite um, loose and again if you're moving something like this around it's easy to actually knock get some vibration in one of these uh, PC boards here and uh, these valves can actually fall out of their sockets some of the valves are extremely loose these two are actually soldered directly into the boards but uh, on the uh, other side on the top side some of them are just in sockets and they really are quite loose so you know once you put something like this into uh, a uh, setup you don't really want to be moving it around too much because that's the kind of risk that you can have actually having uh, one of these valves falling out and actually breaking and the PCBs themselves their construction it doesn't look to be the kind of quality that you come to expect from HP um, in later years especially with RF test equipment they uh, do look kind of uh, simple and uh, as a uh, reference here what I've got here is a uh, PCB board taken out of a uh, HP analyzer from the uh, mid 1970s so just 10 years on and uh, they're using for the construction uh, silver tracked PCBs and actually uh, plated 
with gold to stop tarnishing so this is uh, a generation later 10 years later and uh, it's a world away from uh, these finishing on these PCBs which is uh, a little bit sparse and uh, do look like uh, something that you could actually make yourself at home these days they uh, don't look to be the professional kind of uh, finishing that you come to expect from uh, modern day test equipment or test equipment even from the 1980s so as for the mainframe itself then what I'm going to do I'm going to strip it down remove all these boards and just keep them you know because the vintage uh, components on here are really definitely worth keeping and uh, as for the valves I'll keep all of those as well and the uh, big capacitors here uh, one of the things I've always wanted to build is a Tesla coil but actually build it out of uh, valves now as I said I don't know a great deal about valves so I need to do a lot of homework to actually build that but I will save these valves and uh, hopefully I'll find the time in the future to build a uh, valve Tesla coil I'd really like uh, to build one that has a kind of a steampunk feel to it I think that would be uh, a lot nicer than a uh, solid state version of a Tesla coil so here's the uh, RF plug-in then for the mainframe and uh, this is a uh, 2 gigahertz to 4 gigahertz unit really really simple on the front you've just got uh, the type N connector there for the uh, output and you've just got a small rotary dial here to dial in the power level of that RF output now the thing that adds all the weight to this uh, RF plug-in is this uh, Watkins uh, Johnson uh, backward wave oscillator here in this uh, blue uh, metal box here and uh, we've got a warranty sticker that's uh, the original this is from about 1975-1974 uh, and uh, this actual unit itself looks like it has uh, never been opened so it's like a little time capsule from uh, 30 years ago from the mid 1970s so I'll be interested to see what's actually inside this there's uh, some high voltage actually going to this so there's going to be some kind of heater to heat up that uh, oscillator in there and like I said you need to have this uh, plugged in and uh, powered on for at least 30 minutes before you actually use it so now we're looking at the uh, other side of the plug-in and uh, what I'm actually going to do to get into this is start to disassemble the uh, frame that's uh, built around uh, this device here so if I get rid of this frame I should be able to lift all this off so we can get a closer look at the components start disconnecting them and opening them up and uh, you can see here this is the lever the uh, catch that actually holds the uh, plug-in in place when it's attached to the mainframe and uh, there's quite a lot of rust on uh, certain points on that mainframe and quite a lot of rust on this handle here so you know it is an old unit and it's probably done well to get uh, 40 years uh, worth of working life out of it like uh, I have done I mean uh, I was using it uh, up until about six months ago when it failed and uh, you don't get modern day equipment uh, lasting that long before it actually needs a repair so it has actually done quite well and especially if you can get some usable uh, components out of this it'll then carry on um, actually uh, you know getting a useful life out of it as such not uh, as a whole mainframe but uh, small parts out of it definitely we can uh, actually use some of those hopefully so this uh, piece of aluminium here is actually a uh, transmission line slash attenuator and uh, the patent for this was first lodged in 1961 it has a serial number on it serial number 506 and uh, as I say this uh, particular plug-in is from 1975 so uh, it's a little bit newer than the uh, mainframe itself but um, it's a little bit rough around the edges this the construction of it is not what you'd expect from HP slash Agilent when it comes to uh, microwave test equipment so we'll take a closer look at this in a moment so what I'm really interested in uh, opening up and taking a look at is the uh, oscillator itself it's got its uh, original warranty sticker on the side so this hasn't been opened up in over 30 years so it's like a little electronics time capsule if you will and uh, this popping out of the side here it's got two coaxial cables feeding into it to the uh, output of the RF on the uh, end connector here so I'm presuming this is some kind of uh, mixer harmonic that's uh, blending those two signals together to the output I don't really know 
I can't find any information on this but it has got screws around the side there so we'll open it up and take a look at it later and here we've just got the uh, control board for this then and it's just more vintage uh, transistors and resistors really nice to keep especially these trim pots they're really nice but uh, what I'm going to do is uh, remove this from these big beefy wires that are feeding into here so we can open this up and take a look inside so here's a closer look at the oscillator then and uh, the actual date code on this is from 1977 not 1975 but there are a few different dates scattered around it uh, actually says 1975 on the circuit board itself so uh, possibly the circuit board was made uh, earlier than the uh, oscillator was put together but it's still got the original warranty sticker on the side so what I'm going to do now is remove all the screws from the side but uh, I'm now going to break the uh, warranty sticker and it's the first time it'll be opened up in uh, over 30 years so I'm quite looking forward to seeing what's inside here removed and I did <coughs> so now that I've got all the screws removed I uh, was expecting this part of the case to actually slide off and uh, so now that I've got all the screws removed I was actually expecting the uh, design of this for uh, this outer case to actually s so I've got all the screws removed and I did <coughs> so now that I've got all the screws removed I uh, was expecting this part of the case to actually slide off and uh, so now that I've got all the screws removed I was actually expecting the uh, design of this for uh, this outer case to actually s so I've got all the screws removed and I did <coughs> so now that so the opposite end came away a little bit easier because you can just tug on these uh, wires here and uh, we've got a lot of this black foam inside it's the type of foam that degrades over time and it can get a little bit crumbly and messy but uh, this is the uh, opposite end so if you start pulling away some of this uh, foam hopefully we'll get a better look inside so now that we remove the foam then you can see that it is actually potted from this side as well but uh, this is uh, extremely magnetic so I think what we've probably got here is uh, a small magnetron similar to uh, ones used in a microwave to actually produce the uh, RF there but uh, what we've got also is this copper bridge going across here so they wouldn't have put that in if they didn't need it so I'm going to try and get rid of some of this uh, white uh, rubber compound here that's covering that see if there's anything interesting connected to that copper bar so now that I've got rid of all that white gunk then we can see here we've got a ceramic insulator here and also the magnetic field is extremely strong in this area so that leads me to believe that uh, we're actually dealing with a magnetron here now if it is a magnetron which I think it is then uh, you really have to be careful now because uh, magnetrons uh, contain beryllium that they use as an insulator and uh, that stuff is uh, really toxic to the human body um, you know if it's in a solid state it's fine you can handle it but uh, if it's broken in any way then uh, you have to be really careful and uh, you know this was constructed in uh, the mid 1970s I don't think they took health and safety as seriously as they do these days so I don't want to go uh, too much further with this but I'm going to remove this uh, metal cap here just so we can see how and get a rough idea how it's actually constructed and something else to note it's got this uh, interesting little breather pipe here so I'm not sure what uh, role that is actually playing but it will get extremely hot inside the unit itself so whether that's uh, there to actually relieve some uh, changes in air pressure or something I'm not quite sure so I've managed to actually get this out and uh, I don't know if it's some kind of uh, low powered magnetron design I can't find uh, a lot of information on this online but uh, it came away quite, quite easily and uh, you can probably see there a little bit of glass at the bottom where it's cracked because this was actually connected right down at the bottom on the inside and uh, when I actually pulled this out I did hear a little bit of a hiss so there was some kind of vacuum going on down there and uh, I actually broke this getting it out but it wasn't completely covered in glass it was just attached down at the bottom there so what I'll do I'll take away some of these wrappings so we can have a closer look at this uh, helical going all the way down 
the uh, inside of the glass here and this is down running through the uh, middle of the uh, oscillator and uh, there's not a great deal to see there's just uh, some remains of some glass down there at the bottom and what looks like a uh, electrical contact so there's not a great deal else to actually see inside the uh, oscillator itself so I've just opened up the opposite end and I've got this end piece out here which uh, fits in to this uh, tube here like so and it's uh, connected in a vacuum with a uh, glass seal here and that's what I actually broke if I'd have gone in on the opposite end first I've got this out intact and uh, probably wouldn't have broken it so here's the uh, little valve that I actually broke getting it out and I'm not quite sure what this is and uh, maybe somebody who's into their valves and vintage uh, electronics could uh, let us know in the comments below what we're actually looking at here but uh, if we take a look along the uh, tube itself you can see here's where the two coaxes are soldered on uh, to get some kind of output from this uh, valve tube and uh, if we go along here then you can see in the middle there's that uh, helical running all the way up the uh, center of that glass tube there so I'm, I'm sort of thinking along the lines that uh, this is basically a uh, antenna the tube is uh, producing the RF source and then feeding it out to these uh, two coax cables and here's an even closer shot of that helical coil running up through the uh, middle of that glass tube there it really is a uh, work of art so next then we'll have a look inside this uh, mixer here it's uh, either some kind of mixer uh, combiner arrangement taking these two coaxial cables from the tube itself and then uh, putting it out at the uh, one output here the uh, end connector to uh, output the RF so it's just uh, these three screws along the top here and hopefully it'll just slide out so now we've got the screws removed I'll gently remove the top part of this and then we can see exactly what's inside now at first glance of this you're probably thinking there's not a lot happening in there but uh, I can tell you that the volume of the cavity the diameter of the cavity the length and everything else would be mathematically calculated to combine those two RF outputs into one and keeping it uh, at the frequency that uh, is required and also harmonizing it slightly so it's a nice clean signal so uh, trust me a lot of uh, mathematics is involved in something like this to get that uh, signal on its output so although it doesn't look a great deal inside there uh, the two tubes and everything else is uh, you know a lot of work's gone into actually calculate that so it's very similar to uh, actual antenna design when it comes to uh, transmission lines as well so let's take a closer look at this uh, transmission line slash attenuator as it's described in the uh, patent from 1961 so just before I uh, pop the top off this so uh, we can have a look at what's inside I just wanted to show you the milling around here now where uh, there's a bit of a lip and uh, it doesn't look to be uh, the best kind of uh, you know accurate uh, milling that you would expect from Agilent slash HP with their test equipment especially uh, even in the 1980s the uh, quality just wouldn't actually look like this and there's just a, a big lip on the opposite side as well now I don't know how this actually affects this unit or whether it uh, really is sealed on the inside where it matters but it just looks a little bit rough around the edges here from the outside so unfortunately then the uh, torque screws that hold the two halves in place have actually been in there a little bit too long and they're actually seized in there there's no way I can get these torque screws out without actually uh, drilling them out and I don't really want to do that so I hope you found this uh, video interesting this teardown of a vintage uh, HP oscillator the uh, mainframe from 1966 and the uh, plug-in from the uh, mid 1970s now as I said in the video I haven't got a clue about uh, valve technology I've never worked on anything like this and uh, I've never built anything with uh, valves but um, you know there's some uh, good uh, vintage parts that uh, hopefully I can use in the future that I've got out of this and uh, I do know that uh, certain valves trade for quite a lot of money on eBay 
but uh, I have always wanted to uh, build a uh, Tesla coil and uh, to build one out of uh, tubes it just makes it a little bit more interesting so as I say these are probably uh, high power vacuum tubes here so possibly I could start to base the uh, Tesla coil off these two tubes I don't know yet until I do a little bit more homework on that so as I say I hope you uh, enjoyed the video and if you did please give it a thumbs up any uh, questions or comments drop them below and if you have any further information that you can add to this please uh, let me know in the comments and uh, you know anything that I've missed that you actually know uh, does a particular job in all this again please uh, let us know so hopefully you did enjoy the video then and hopefully you'll join me on the next one